Lord, we lift up the name of Jesus all over this sanctuary, God. We come before the throne room right now and we enter your courts with praise and thanksgiving in our heart, Lord. No matter what yesterday was, no matter what tomorrow might bring, Lord, we just enter your courts right now with thanksgiving in our hearts, Father. We enter your courts with praise. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, the Trinity, three in one. We praise you. We praise you, Lord. You are exalted. You are uplifted, Father. You are greater than any circumstance in my life. You're sovereign over my circumstances, God. There's no boss man I have. There's no leader in this country who is not under your authority this morning, God. So we trust in you this morning, Lord. Lord, my yesterday was dark, and my tomorrow might be dark to, but I'm just going to go ahead and speak to that mountain and I'm going to tell it to move move mountain darkness flee at the sound of the name of Jesus healing in the name of Jesus restoration in the name of Jesus all over this place God we bless you you are the lion and the lamb Lord the one who conquers and the one who was slain father hallelujah come on lift up a shout of praise in this place come on say oh
bring his presence into the room. Come on with your hand, clap with your voice, sing it. Oh. Come on, welcome the healer with your voice, sing oh, sing it. Oh. Listen. Like you want to come like you want to Jesus have your way. Hey, this is a real simple song. He's the God of the breakthrough. I like this, nothing, nothing can stop you. This is your heart's desire. Let your freedom reign. This is your turn. You can sing this right here. You're falling now. You're falling now like heaven's rain in front of God. Your children's praise. Your tearing
won't you give Jesus some praise in this place? Yeah. Come on, is God awesome? Is God mighty? Is He strong? Is He great? Come on, is God awesome in this place? Do you believe that He can move mountains? He can keep you in the valley. And He can hide you from the rain, from the storms of this life. He's going to bring you through. You may need that this morning. He's going to bring you through the storms. Sing this with me. My God is awesome. And He can move mountains. Keep me in the valley. Hide me from the rain. My God is awesome. He heals me when I'm broken. Strength where I've been weakened. Forever He reigns. You can sing this. My God is awesome. Say awesome. Awesome. Declare it out. Come on, say awesome. Awesome. Yes, He is. It's okay. He is. He's awesome. Awesome. Sing it again. My God is awesome. He's so awesome in this place. My God is awesome. Yes, He is. Awesome. Let's sing that next verse. My God is awesome. My God is Savior of the whole world. Savior. Listen, giver of salvation. Yes, He's such a good giver. By His stripes I am healed. Yes.
Thank you, God. Inflatable, 
workers for outside and a couple more for the inside as well. It's going to be a fun night. It's going to be really laid back for our church family to where we can all just take time to show love to our community without the stress. There's a lot of different companies coming in to help us with that this year. Um, very excited about fun memories with Cynthia Young and her group that's going to be coming in, providing the food, providing all the work that we normally have to do. Her and her crew are doing it all this year. So we are so thankful for that, Cynthia. Thank you so much. Because that means, that means that we, because of her heart, because of her heart and her company's heart, we're going to get to spend even more time just smiling and sharing that joy. So if you haven't signed up, please go ahead and take the time. We really would appreciate it. And again, it's October 31st from 6 to 9. The shifts are not that long. You can sign up for however long you need to serve. There's a spot for everyone. Candy's still coming in. We all know the kids love the candy. I'm thankful and we're thankful for everything that you guys have done to bring that in. And uh, whatever you have done to bring it into this house. The 31st is going to be amazing. There's going to be a lot of happy children because of your hearts, because of your prayers. And that's the most important. There's an event t-shirt that Pastor Mark has designed for this year. It's really awesome. If you want to see me at the table, I'll show it to you. The shirt cost is $10. We all want to be unified. We all look the same. So grab you a shirt, order you a shirt, and then they'll be available on the 31st, the last day to sign up for that and to get a shirt. It's the 27th. I think that's all of my announcements. <sighs> With that said... our tithes and offerings to the Lord. How amazing is it that we have such a wonderful home that we can bring our tithes and offerings to? You know, the, Christ loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. And whenever it comes from your heart, oh, the blessings you see. I tell the kids all the time, it's not about you throwing it in the offer plate and saying, there, God, there it is. Take it. Bless me. No, I tell the kids, it's all about getting excited. What God has done for you, you get to give back to Him. And think of all the amazing things that God can do and will do because of it. I want to say thank you for bringing your tithes and offerings today before we pray over it. And, um, Pastor Eric, it's good to see you this morning. Glad you're feeling better. Glad that you, you are here. Lord, oh, we are so glad our pastor is feeling better and ready to bring forth the word here in just a few moments. If you brought your tithes and offerings, just raise them up to the Lord. No matter how you get, whether it's by phone, whether it's by check, it doesn't matter. Raise it up in the ear right now. Let's just give it, give back to God. Let's thank Him for what He's done for us. Father God, Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for this time that we can have to come into your house, to come into your home, Father, and just praise your wonderful name. Lord, I thank you for each person that is here at New Image today that has taken the time to come out and just love you, worship you, and just dig more into your word, Father God. Lord, we ask that you just bless these tithes and offerings given today. Lord, we thank you for all the different outreaches and opportunities that we have because of these wonderful cheerful givers that we have here in New Image. Father, we just ask that you just bless each person that gives today. Bless each prayer that's lifted up. Thank you for all that you do. For us in your name we pray. Amen. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love.
the Holy Spirit's going to give us supernatural strength and anointing to communicate the way He wants things communicated. I love Him and I thank Him. Father, we just, we just thank You for this moment. We thank You, Holy Spirit, for the Word. I thank You, God, for what You have been revealing to me. And I ask You, Holy Spirit, to help me to do it justice. Take all of my intellect, take all of my personality, take everything that makes Eric who Eric is, and I ask you to use Eric today by your hand and by your breath to make a difference not just in someone's life, but make a difference in many lives for eternity. I pray for that right now in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen and amen. This has been a crazy past week for me and and uh, you know there's a lot of things in life that try to become distractions in your life and and you 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 have moments in your life where you have to let the distractions know that their their power is limited limited and my daughter kept asking me how are you going to do this and I said honey I've I've stood up to preach with a bucket beside me to uh, to vomit in. Now, that was a long time ago. I realized that some of y'all couldn't handle that today. But uh, I preached a sermon one time. I think I titled it, Sometimes You Just Need to Throw Up. Y'all ever notice how you feel better after you throw up, but you fight it all the way? I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. But then you feel better. That would be a good sermon one day. Sometimes you just need to throw up. Well, I began to imitate as though I was about to throw up until all of a sudden I saw someone that was about to throw up because I was imitating that I was about to throw up. And I realized, okay, we gotta, we got to quit that. Some people can't even handle that sound. And uh, so, so I'm not here this morning to uh, show uh, my weakness. I'm here to show his strength. And I will promise you one thing, I've never stood up that God did not give supernatural strength to do his work. And so this is going to be a beautiful moment. This isn't about the uh, way he looks or the way he sounds or the way he acts. This is about the presence of God doing eternal work for his glory. And when you're dealing with a subject like what we've been dealing with, oh man, alive. This is something that the enemy has been able to to operate in secret and he's been able to operate quietly for generations and we have taken a spotlight and we have shined it right on the issue and the enemy's not happy about that but once again he doesn't get a vote in what God is doing in our life so today is trust part three we've been talking about get the rust of my trust I've got to get the rust off my trust. We've got to remove this rust that is there to weaken me and to ultimately make me frail and potentially damage me forever. And so last week I shared with you the importance of being a trustworthy person. The importance of being a trustworthy person. And I talked extensively about how the damage that is caused to someone who has been hurt or, or offended or broken because of the lack of trust in another. If you are not a trustworthy person, you can cause a lot of heartache and a lot of damage in people's lives. And some people, that damage lasts a lifetime. For some people, that damage is something that they've spent thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on in counseling, in therapy, and they're still struggling because somebody wasn't trustworthy. And so it's important because I'm talking to Christians the Christians are trustworthy people. We should all be trustworthy people. That's what God expects of us. That's what we should be. That's how we, how we should live. 
This week I want to share with you some steps that we can take to rebuild some trust. This is certainly not a conclusive list and I'm sure I'll share more later, but, but I want to begin today by sharing some of the things that are necessary because rebuilding trust is one of the hardest things you're ever going to do in your life. Rebuilding trust is very difficult and it takes a masterful plan by the Holy Spirit for anyone to be successful in rebuilding trust. The severity of the violation can and often will determine the severity of the struggle to trust again. The severity of the violation matters. The severity of the violation is extremely important. For instance, if a man were to molest someone, a molestation is far different than someone not being trustworthy to show up on time. There's a big difference in saying, I don't trust you because you'll molest me versus I don't trust you because you don't come to work on time. They're both trust issues, but they're greatly different in the level of of severity when you have relationships with people you have varying degrees of love and emotional investment in those relationships now I can sit here and tell you that I love my children the same and you would believe me and I do but there's a difference even with my own two children, in the different emotional investment. There's a difference in the relationships. They're not the same. Do I love them the same equally? Yes. Do I love them the same in the sense of emotional investment? No. Now, I know some of you parents are probably thinking, well, that just doesn't make sense. Oh, it's true. You just may not want to admit it. I do not love Brittany more than Kyle, but there is a different emotional investment in my relationship with Brittany than there is Kyle. And the same is true with Kim and Kyle and Kim and Brittany. I love all of you equally, but I don't even know some of you as well as I do others. There is a different level. I have taught my children since they were very young. That when you love hard, you get hurt hard. I've told people right before funeral services, when I've seen families broken over a child that have passed tragically, or, or a mother or a father, and they're so torn inside and they're hurting inside, I tell them many times, I whisper, I say, when you love somebody hard, it hurts hard. I know they don't want to hear it at the time. I've had so many look at me and say, but Pastor, it hurts. And I say back to them, it's supposed to. You say, well, that seems cruel. It's not cruel. It's the truth. When there is a deep intimacy, there is something about that that creates a level of severity to trust issues that are not always the same for everybody. Deeper the love, deeper the pain. That's why some people never understand the level of pain that you're going through. They didn't love like you did. They never had the deepness that you did. As a pastor, sometimes, you know, I think sometimes people think you don't hear things. There's a, I don't know why God does it, but he, he lets words just come rolling right back to you so many times and, and things. And, and I've heard people say things like, you know, why don't he just get over it? Why don't he, why don't he just let it go? Why don't, it's because you have no idea the severity and the depth of the relationship. You see, we need to be careful before we start thinking someone should just get over it. 
Because you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know the depth of the relationship. You don't know the intimacy of it. You don't know the pain of it. You don't know the severity of it. You don't know all the details. To be able to pass judgment on what somebody else should be doing. You never invested an ounce of energy. They invested their life. But you know better what they need to do. That's self-righteousness. And foolishness. If you don't have that depth, you don't know the severity. So let me give you this morning some things that are critical. Some things that are important. Number one... Be a trustworthy person. Be a trustworthy person. You say, well, Pastor Eric, I thought that's what you said all last week. It is. And I can't say it loud enough, and I can't say it enough. Be a trustworthy person. If you're going to rebuild trust, you can't be a liar and a manipulator and a trustworthy person at the same time. If you're going to rebuild trust in a relationship, you got to stop the games. You got to stop it. Quit making excuses. Quit justifying it. Quit blaming somebody else for it. Take responsibility for your actions. Be a man. Be a woman. Be a trustworthy person. Or forget it. Forget it. If you're not going to be trustworthy, you can't rebuild trust. Number two, make better relationship choices. <laughs> yeah, this one right here needs to be preached across the world. Make better relationship choices. The best way to rebuild trust is to minimize the need to rebuild trust in your life. Minimize the risk. Minimize the heartache. Minimize the chances of this happening in the first place. How in the world do we do that? Well, listen carefully. Sometimes we allow intimate relationships in our life way too quickly. Way too quickly. I am shocked, I am absolutely shocked at how quickly people open their souls to someone a week prior they didn't even know who they were. They met someone on Facebook and are telling them all about their children, telling them all about their problems. Telling them about everything that's going on in their life, why they didn't like their ex-husband or their ex-wife and why they're just lonely or why, and just spilling their life out to a stranger. Just because the picture that you are speaking to has the boom, boom, pow doesn't mean you need to be being intimate with it. Somebody say amen. I'm going to preach. We don't like to admit it, but when we meet someone, there's usually something about them that we're attracted to initially. Something. It's not the same for everyone, but there's usually something in that initial meeting or conversation. Maybe, maybe it's their looks. I would say that's usually one of the first things is, is he handsome? Is she, is she beautiful? What do they look like? Sometimes it's their personality. Sometimes they are fun to be with. Sometimes they, they make me laugh. Maybe it's, maybe it's their career. Maybe it's the authoritative position that they have in life. Now, some people even will say, hey, I like his car. 
I want to talk to him and ride in that, in that car. Now we act like that doesn't ever happen. It happens all the time. It happens because they got a motorcycle. I want to take a ride. Maybe it's the home that they live in or the money that they have, but I promise you there's something they're attracted to. There's something. It's not bad that there's something that there's an attraction for. The problem is, is we began to be intimate with people based off the wrong attractions. You see, when you want to help the relationship with somebody, none of the things I mentioned are the reasons for intimacy. See, if you want to help the relationship, then there needs to be some attraction to honesty, integrity, transparency, morals and values, ethics. But pastor, they got the boom, boom, pow. They got it. I tried hard, but then it was boom, boom, pow. Girl, I'm in love. Is he honest? Oh, I don't have a clue. Can you trust him? I, I'm not sure yet. But we rush into relationships. We rush into things that we have not done our proper assessment for the value of the relationship. And we're impatient. And we want it now. We're already scheduling the wedding. We're getting married. I'm gonna have, I'm gonna have a wonderful life with this person. Can you trust him? I don't know. Is he honest? I don't know. Is he transparent? I think he is. What gives you the opportunity to discover and to find out these things? I want to tell you what it is. It's time. It's time. Healthy relationships are not built overnight. It takes time. You must give it time. The very thing we don't want to give it, you must give it. That is time. I want you to listen carefully and do not forget this. Trust doesn't have to be rushed. Trust doesn't have to be rushed. Trust doesn't have to be rushed. Don't you let some man talk you into something too fast. Don't you let some woman talk you into something too fast. Trust does not have to be rushed. When someone has the package of morals and ethics and values, integrity and transparency, you don't have to rush that relationship. You don't have to rush that relationship. But when that relationship's built on the boom, boom, pow, you done, you done jumped into the hallelujah and, and then you're going to be calling somebody because you found out somebody else was singing hallelujah. I might as well preach. All of a sudden, you find out what you thought was money. He ain't got no money. His credit's about three fifty, and he wants to know if you'll put something in your name. God help me, Jesus! I ain't trying to kill nobody. There are some people that do not deserve your intimacy. Save that for the person that trust doesn't have to be rushed. Save that for the person that is patient with you. And says, let's just take our time assessing how severe we want this relationship to go. And folks, I want you to listen carefully because we often can understand this based upon the relationship in dating 
But this same principle is applied to your best friends. Girls and girls and men and best friends with men. I want you to listen carefully. You don't rush into that. And you never let your loneliness be the motivator to skip over your objectivity. You never allow loneliness to be the dictator of relationships. It is perfectly fine to go have coffee with your friend. Go bowling with your friend. Go to the mall with your friend. Whatever it is you do, it's cool. But you do not open your soul to people you don't even know if you can trust. If you find out they can't keep their mouth shut about others, you are a fool. If you think they're going to keep their mouth shut about you. I'm trying to help somebody. See, I'm talking about minimizing the risk. Because see, if you're slow and you take your time and you're patient, you're going to find out some people, they're not worth my investment. You begin to pull back. In other words, you never open your soul to somebody and therefore you protect yourself from the level of severity of trustworthiness that they were able to inflict upon your life. As a matter of fact, when you begin to practice what I'm talking about, very few people ever reach that level. Very few people ever reach that level. But I would rather have two real trustworthy relationships than a hundred phony, loudmouth, gossiping, care about themselves, fake relationships in my life. Number three, forgive quickly. If there's one area that's extremely important, maybe more important than some of these that I'll mention, it is to forgive people quickly. But please listen carefully. Forgiveness is not always for the person that caused you pain. It's oftentimes for yourself. Most of the time it's for yourself. And that is something you get to do Without anyone else earning it, deserving it, you do it for you. I forgive you for me. If someone were molested, you forgive them for you. That don't mean you go back to the birthday party. I'm just telling you, you forgive for you. Healing begins because of your forgiveness. Forgiving someone doesn't mean that you'll be able to reconcile. I'm going to say that again. Because as Christians, sometimes we screw this up. Forgiveness does not mean you will automatically reconcile. Now, I want to be very careful because I want to give you a biblical principle and standard that on the surface, if you don't catch this, you're going to think they contradict one another and they don't. First of all, biblical forgiveness usually will lead to reconciliation. Biblical forgiveness intends to lead to reconciliation. That's the hope, the objectivity. That forgiveness can lead to reconcile. See, that's the kind of forgiveness the Lord Jesus Christ has. Now I want you to try to imagine the Lord saying, I forgive you, but I don't want anything else to do with you. That's not God's heart, is it? God is God and we're not. But forgiveness can ideally lead to reconciliation. However, it does not automatically end there. Listen carefully. When does forgiveness happen that doesn't lead to reconciliation? Listen carefully. If the offender has not repented or acknowledged their sin 
and does not seek forgiveness. We can still grant forgiveness, but reconciliation is not warranted. If the one that violated you does not acknowledge their sin, refuses to repent of their sin, refuses to make things right by owning their sin. I can forgive you, but I am not obligated to reconcile with you. Now that's where Christians sometimes began their self-righteous judgment of other relationships. Because if J.J. and I are in a close relationship and I violate his trust of me, I stole something from him. And J.J. wants to reconcile, make it right, and he forgives me, but I won't even acknowledge it. I don't admit it, and I'm not taking ownership of it. J.J. is in no way obligated to reconcile with me. I forgive the dude, but he ain't coming back to my house. And then other Christians won't like, well, if you really love Jesus, you'd let him come over. If you really love Jesus, you'd let him come over. My goodness, I don't understand. We're all there. We're grilling hamburgers. It's not like he's just going to walk in and walk out with your TV. It's not your house. It wasn't your violation. It was not your relationship. Shut up. Who cares what you think? doesn't matter. It's none of your business. If Christians would mind their own business in a lot of things in life, people would be better off. Just mind your own business. Now, can God work something out with J.J. and I, and maybe three years later, we're over there, and I'm like, J.J., you know what I did was wrong, man. I shouldn't have stole that $100 bill from you. I'm sorry. I saw it sitting on your dresser, and when we walked by, and you were showing me that painting, and I, I took it, man. I was wrong. I, 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 I've got a lot of reasons why I did it, but none of them are right. I was wrong. I want to let you know I acknowledge that. I am currently working a second job. I'm going to pay you back. I'm going to work this out. I'm sorry. And this, this kind of crap embarrasses me. And, and dude, I, I care more about us than I do sitting here acting like I didn't do anything wrong. Can God work with that? Is it any of your business? No. So you don't need to go up to change and say, well, what happened? I, I saw you and Eric talking. Y'all work some stuff out. See, I see this crap all the time, man. In church, it's none your business. Forgive quickly. But if reconciliation is going to happen, the one that did the offending is going to have to do some repenting. And I am old school. If you're not willing to repent of what you did to me, we don't reconcile. And I'm justified before God for it. And I got news for you. If you don't repent to God. Do you not understand. That repentance is an obligatory. Issue with God. Reconciling with you. You must repent. Of your sins. Well God doesn't expect me to do anything. That he doesn't. When he reconciles as well. Amen. Number four, give people time. Give people time. They're not going to trust you just because you said, I'm sorry. I've been in counseling sessions and I literally have heard men say, well, I told her I was sorry. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, my God, what else I got to do? I told her 20 times, I'm sorry. I wrote it on the mirror. I'm sorry. I wrote it in the grass. I'm sorry. I, I shouted it from the rooftops. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What else I got to do? You got to give people time. If you're going to rebuild trust, it takes time. Just go ahead and accept that. And listen very carefully. The offender doesn't get to decide how long it's going to take. The offended one determines that. 
How many of you know not everyone heals at the same pace? You can't bring up your friend. Well, he did this to his wife and she forgave him three weeks later. Well, go marry her. It takes time. Not everyone can heal at the same pace. And if someone's not willing to be patient with you and provide the time and space to heal, they probably only care about themselves and you're probably wasting your time. If someone understands that I can give you time and space and I'm here to support you and rebuild trust in your life, you can work with that person. Number five, make sure expectations are not unreasonable. Make sure expectations are not unreasonable. This is extremely important because when you've been hurt, you must make sure that your expectations for the one who hurt you are reasonable. While they will pay a trust tax for their actions, make sure that you don't expect them to be superhuman righteous because it's impossible for them to be that. I'm not talking about giving them, giving them a pass to continue to be, to lack trustworthiness. But I am talking about understanding that they are a human being and they're not going to be a perfect person. If you're looking for a perfect person and your standard is perfection, they will fail you. They will disappoint you. They're not capable of being a perfect person. If you can't live up to it yourself, don't expect it from others. Number six. Pastor Blake, would you come please? Just yourself. Trust God first. Before you do any of the things that I've shared with you, if you want to rebuild trust in a relationship, if you want to get the rust off the trust, it starts with God. In every sermon I've told you that everything begins with God. Trust begins with God. A healthy relationship begins with God. Everything must begin with God. When you are trying to establish trust with someone, it's important that you go to God and you spend some time with Him intimately. This is a time where you go to God and you just let God love on you. This is a time where you go to God with your, your bleeding soul. Where you've been cut and when you've been bruised. And you go to God with your anger and you go to God with all of your emotions that are pinned up and everything that's inside of you and you just go to God as empty as you are and you just let Him hold you. It's really important that you get this. It's really important that this happens. You must spend time with Him and let Him hold you. You must spend time in that safe place of His presence and let Him hold you. Nurture you, care for you, encourage you. You see, empty people do not have the strength to deal with brokenness. When you've had the breath kicked out of you, when you find out that she's been talking to another or he's been talking to another or they lied and they manipulated and they played me for a fool when the breath has been kicked out of you and you're empty you don't have the strength you don't have the strength to deal with the brokenness and that's why you must go to God first Because only God can feel you. 
Only God can put the wind back in you. Only God can fill you with His breath. Only God can fill you with that peace. Only God can give you the healing that you need. If you're not careful, you'll run to the one who offended you, the one that kicked the breath out of you, and you'll expect them to put air back in you. And the truth is, they're incapable. They're incapable of giving you what you need. And you get, you get more frustrated with them. If you loved me, you would do this. If you cared, you would do this. I don't understand. I don't know why you would treat me this way. You know I'm empty and you don't feel me. You're asking them to be God. And they can't be God. You see, you got to go find that time to just get alone. Raw, ripped open, cutting and bleeding, broken. And you just get along with God. And he may not say much at the beginning, JJ. He may not say very much at the beginning. Sometimes God's greatest talking is when He just holds you. And there's something powerful, Blake, when, when you know you're empty and you know you're broken. And you know you don't trust anybody anymore. And you're embarrassed. And you feel like a fool. And you can't believe that this is where you are in life. And it's come to this. You are so ashamed. There is something powerful when all you do is get into the presence of God. And there's nobody else there. And ripped open and raw before Him. All of a sudden, God begins to... Just breathe. Just breathe. Just breathe on you. And all of a sudden, that which was so empty begins to sense that there is still life. There's still life. There's still hope. And in those intimate times with God, you go. rather than just being emotional you go back and through prayer and patience and healing and transparency everything that is necessary you begin to work on that rust it's on your trust and you're not doing it for anybody else you're doing it so that you're not fragile so that you're not weak so that you're not feeble you want healing in your life it all begins with trusting God it all begins with getting intimate with the Lord You'll never have the energy. You'll never have the energy and the strength that you need to reconcile with your husband or wife or your best friend or your ministry partner. You'll never have the strength you need within yourself. You need that intimacy. Trust doesn't have to be rushed. We're not trying to fix a marriage overnight. Right. We're not trying to fix a lifetime of financial irresponsibility overnight. We're not trying to fix anything overnight. Trust doesn't have to be rushed. And with the Lord's help, God will bring you to a place of peace and confidence in yourself. The healing will take place and you'll begin to step out in faith, trusting again. Trusting again. Trusting again. We all know what it's like to have faith and to trust something. We do it quite often. 
went to the uh, well I actually went to two different doctors Friday first one said they couldn't do what I needed done and I needed extra care that they were not capable of giving me sent me to another place I went to them doctor went and did his thing told me this is what it is this is what's going on this is what we need to do with it. and he looks at me and says do you want a shot to get, to get things going I said heck yeah I could barely open my jaw at the time and it was hurting and I was sick of it anything at the point just yes I want a shot well I'm, I don't get a lot of shots let's just say and that shot wasn't going in my shoulder And I'll let y'all figure out where it went. And if I'd have known that before I said, heck yeah, I might would have changed my mind. You know, I don't feel that bad after all. But what was interesting to me is I went through this process. The lady said to me, she said, you know, the needle's not that painful. It's more of the medicine. And she said, one of the reasons is it has to enter slowly. And so we're going to give this to you slowly. And she proceeds to give me my shot, and it's going in slowly. I said, well, this doesn't hurt. I, it's not about pain. I'm, I'm not even worried about the pain of the needle. I just don't like the needle. And I said, this is okay. I just don't want you taking anything out of me. And I went through this process, and I'm sitting there, and I said, man, I don't have a clue what the crap they just put in me. I can't pronounce it. I don't even know what it's for. I don't know where it was made. I don't know where it came from. I just went and, and, and literally met a man for three minutes and he told me I needed this and I said, okay. I don't know his name. I don't know if he's qualified. I don't know what makes him qualified. I wasn't there when he took his exam. He may have had the worst GPA in the school. I don't know nothing about this cat. After all, look where he's working. I mean, I'm thinking all this, and I just let him stick me with something. How many of you know you have to trust people sometimes? I didn't have the answers. See, sometimes you want all the answers. Sometimes you just need a shot. You're going to have to trust God. I get on airplanes all the time. I never meet the pilot. I don't know if he's 25 or 95. I don't know if he's drunk or he's not drunk. I don't know if he's blind and can't see a flipping thing on front of you. I don't know. But I'm getting on this plane and I'm going to fly because I trust that God is going to take care of me. See, there's a lot of things you do in your life and you trust God to get you there. God wants to get you in a place in your relationships where you can trust again even though you don't have all the facts. You may not get all the facts. But you can't have peace. And you can't have healing. And you can trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not to your own understanding. But in all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths. You can trust in the Lord with all your heart. You can trust in the Lord with all your heart. So I want to encourage you today as we're working towards getting the rust off our trust. Spend some intimate time with God. Let Him breathe on you. Let Him hold you till you can trust again. And find a little strength to fight this battle when the enemy's whispering and telling you you're a fool I can't believe you're doing this you just got to know that you've been in the presence of the Lord and his presence makes the difference let's stand together please today I'm going to trust the Lord with all of my heart today I'm going to trust the Lord with all of my heart today I'm going to trust God and because I trust God, I'm going to trust that God's going to help me to trust whoever it is that you need to build that trust with. Whoever it is that God's trying to reconcile. Whoever it is that God's trying to heal. 
You don't have to rush it. Trust doesn't have to be rushed. Be patient. But get into His presence. If God's working on you, would you close your eyes and just lift one hand to Him. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I stretch my hands towards those that have raised a hand today that said, God is working on me. God is working on me. I sense that He's he's teaching me and he's stirring me and he's helping me and he's feeding me he's preparing me i know god's working on me i know god's healing me i know god's gonna do a work in me i know something powerful is gonna happen in me i know that i matter to the lord i know that he cares about this and i know that he won't leave me in this place where i'm dry and i'm ripped open and i'm weak and i'm hurting and i'm broken and i'm confused i know god is not gonna leave me here but he loves me too much and he cares for me too much I know God will fill me and make me strong I know God's working on me I know you're working on me Lord go ahead and tell him I know you're working on me Lord I know you're stirring me God I know you're healing me God I know you're breathing on me God I thank you Father that I don't have to be rushed I thank you God that today I can just take a deep breath and not try to figure it all out today I don't have to make it happen today I don't have to get in a hurry God because trust doesn't have to be rushed oh God I thank you for your peace and I thank you for your strength I thank you for your mercy and I thank you for your grace I thank you God that you're helping me you're holding me and you're breathing on me I thank you Father that I will trust again and I'll be more wise and more prepared than ever before I thank you Holy Spirit for loving me in Jesus awesome and mighty name I pray Amen and amen. Let's give God a hand of praise, man. He's so trustworthy. Amen. Amen. Today is hug at your own risk day. I don't think I'm contagious, but I don't know. I have had fever, and I woke up feeling the same way I did, and I'm doped up right now to get through this service. But I will hug you if you want some. God bless you as you go.